minutes. You will each have 30 minutes, and I will try to help you with your time because I know you can't see a timer like you would in the courtroom, but if you could also please try to watch the time yourselves, that would be great. With that, we will hear first from the government. Mr. Flengey, please proceed. May it please the court. I'm August Flengey with the Justice Department here on behalf of the United States. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. The executive order at issue puts a temporary pause on entry for individuals from seven countries that Congress and the last president determined in a similar context pose special risks in terms of terrorist infiltration into our country. Those determinations were made in 2015 and 2016 based either on a congressional determination or statutory factors including their foreign terrorist organizations had significant presence in the country or the country served as a safe haven for terrorists. The order also temporarily halted refugee program. This judgment was well within the president's power as delegated to him by Congress and it is constitutional as the court in Boston in Halal Kalam recently held. Under Section 212F, Congress has expressly authorized the President to suspend entry of classes of aliens when it is, de when it is necessary or when otherwise it would be detrimental to the interests of the United States. That's what the President did here. And the President's determination that a 90-day pause was needed for the seven countries at issue here in order to ensure adequate standards, and that's language from the order, for visa screening was plainly constitutional. The district's court's order, which contained no assessment of the legality of the order, was an error, and we encourage the court to stay. A key factor in the order and its temporary nature is the, was the president's determination that there was a need to review existing practices for screening foreign nationals who apply for visas. The order recognizes... If I can interrupt for a moment. You're, yes. asking, uh, you're asking for a stay of the temporary order of the district court. Uh, no matter which way we rule on the stay, presumably that appeal of the order remains in place. Is that correct? Or are you trying... Sometimes I get the impression from the papers that we're trying to argue the merits of the appeal itself rather than the merits of the stay. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the, there is some overlap, but yes, we are at this point just asking for a stay pending review by uh, this court. Uh, of course, the standards are pretty similar since both would look at the traditional uh, uh, injunction standards. Uh, with respect to those standards, I do want to say there are, uh, there are two kind of significant irreparable injuries that we are citing in support of our request for a stay. The first irreparable injury has to do with the assessment of risk that the President made in balancing our interest in, in welcoming people into this country with our interest in making sure our procedures are secure so that uh, the risk of terrorism is acceptable. The President struck that balance and the, the District Court's order has, uh, has upset that balance. Uh, this is a traditional national security judgment that is assigned to the political branches and the President, and uh, the, the, the court's order immediately altered that. Have you offered any evidence to support this uh, need that you're describing for the executive order, or are you really arguing that we can't even ask about whether there's evidence because this decision is not reviewable? Sure. The, the order itself includes findings. Uh, those findings recognize the crucial role that screening uh, presents in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the visa process. They recognize that uh, numerous foreign-born individuals have been convicted or implicated in crimes since September 11th. It recognizes that deteriorating, condi deteriorating conditions in certain countries uh, create further problems. So the order created a pause so that those, so that the screening, the screening uh, process could immediately 
immediately be reviewed to ensure it's adequate. Has the government pointed to any evidence connecting these countries with terrorism? These proceedings have been moving very fast. I can, uh, and uh, the, the, the strongest point on that is that uh, in 2015 and 2016, both Congress and the administration made determinations that it, these seven countries posed the greatest risk of terrorism. That, and in doing so, uh, restricted visa waiver to people who had even even uh, even traveled to those countries over the last five or six years. Uh, the, the executive order relies on that determination, and that is, I think, the, the strongest type of reliance where uh, the president is relying on uh, Congress's determination that these are countries of concern, and Congress's procedures to identify countries of concern based on significant terrorist activity in the countries. This is Judge Clifton. That's, I understand the concept of that, but it's pretty abstract, and, and it's not like there haven't been processes in place to take some care with people coming from those countries. Indeed, those are the, the determinations in the statute and by the prior administration you're pointing to. Is there any reason for us to think that there's a real risk or that circumstances have changed so that there would be a real risk if existing procedures weren't allowed to stay in place while the administration, the new administration, conducts its review? Well, the president determined that there was a real risk. That's why the president determined that the best course was a temporary, it's, it's a short halt in, uh, in uh, entry for 90 days while these procedures are looked at. And that's understandable. Uh, the president comes into office with an obligation to protect the national security of our country. Uh, he, the president understands and it explains in the order that these visa screening pr procedures are crucial. Uh, and the president understands that Congress identified these seven countries as well as, uh, as, well as in 2016 with the president. That's the thing can be that, of course, in, in naming those seven countries, what Congress did was to provide that people coming from those countries had to get visas. In other words, they couldn't just come into the country without a visa. And that permitted, of course, uh, the usual investigations before you give somebody a visa. And in uh, in the transcript of the hearing in the district court, the district court asks the representative of the Department of Justice, uh, you know, you, you're in the Department of Justice, uh, how many uh, federal offenses have we had uh, being committed by people who came in with uh, visas from these countries? And I, I can the, ultimate, the ultimate was the answer was there haven't been any. Yes, Your Honor. These proceedings have been moving quite fast, and we're doing the best we can. I can't sure, cite... Yeah, uh, the proceedings are moving fast, but you appealed to us before you continued in the district court to develop the record. So why should we be hearing this now if it sounds like you're trying to say you're going to present other evidence later? Uh, well, I was just about to at least uh, mention a few examples. Uh, there have been a number of people from Somalia uh, connected to Al-Shabaab who have been uh, convicted uh, in the United States. Is uh, that in the record? Can you point us to what, where in the record you're referring? Uh, it is not in the record. Uh, there has also uh, uh, been other examples, but again, you're correct. These are not in the record. Uh, the reason we sought immediate relief and a stay is because of the the court's, the district court's decision uh, overrides the president's national security judgment about the level of risk, and we've been talking about the level of risk that is acceptable. As soon as we're having that discussion, uh, it should be acknowledged that it, the president is the official that is charged with making those judgments. I'd also like to... Uh, so are we back to you, you, uh, are you arguing then that the president's decision in that regard is unreviewable? The, uh, yes. The, the, what we, we, there are 
obviously constitutional limitations, but we're discussing the risk assessment. What are the constitutional limitations that the government acknowledges? Well, I would more say that the plaintiff has asserted various constitutional limitations. And I think the case that is most on point as far as constitutional interests is Mandel and Dinn. And in those cases where you have a U.S. citizen raising a claim, the court looks only at the U.S. citizen's constitutional claim, and even then looks at whether the decision is facially legitimate and bona fide. The executive order here meets that standard easily. It relies on – In both of those cases, though, it's specific statutes by Congress that set forth specific criteria that were then applied factually were at issue. The President is not applying any specific criteria from Congress here, is he? Yes, the President is. The President is applying Section 212F, which authorizes the President to suspend entry of classes of aliens if their entry would be, quote, detrimental to the interests of the United States. It now – the Supreme Court recognized that Congress and the President share – the act of exclusion of aliens is a fundamental act of sovereignty that the Congress and the President – they're within the powers of Congress and the President. So our point would be that there's limited review and the executive order – and most limited review in the executive order easily passes that test. And that would only be true if there's a – What kind of limited review do you acknowledge is appropriate? Again, we're not acknowledging any review on the facts of this case because of a lot of standing and other problems with the state bringing the claim. What we acknowledge is that Mandel – Mandel conducted a limited review to see that the decision was bona fide and legitimate. Haven't there been allegations here of bad faith? And doesn't Mandel and Dinn, the concurrence of Dinn, envision that that's something that we would need to look at? When reviewing an executive order of the President under Section 212F, the review should be confined to the four corners of the document to determine if the document – if the decision itself and the executive order's findings have any – raise – have any issues with respect to the standard. And again, I'm sort of far ahead of our position. This would be if there is a party in the U.S. withstanding to raise constitutional – their own constitutional claims, and there are problems at each step of that analysis. The state of Washington doesn't have these kind of constitutional interests. There are – the state of Washington can't bring a parent's patria suit on behalf of its citizens in this context. And even – Let me interrupt you for a second there. There's some talk in the Supreme Court cases of quasi-sovereign interests. And, for instance, a state might have an interest in clean air. And when it sues to protect its air, it's necessarily acting for its citizens. A state itself can't smell air. It can't see air. It has to be acting on behalf of its citizens when it brings a case like that. Yet there seems to be authority for the state to bring that kind of a claim. Well, the problem in the immigration context, and actually more generally, is a third party can't challenge visa denials or revocations. The claims that the state is bringing are essential. It certainly can. But the whole point of the Dinn case was that Dinn himself, or rather Dinn's husband, couldn't challenge, but she could. And three justices of the court were prepared to throw it out at the first step, but the other six justices were not. They took up the claim. Why is the state of Washington in a comparable position, say, as the proprietor of the state universities, 
having the same kind of interest that the scholar plaintiffs did in Mandel? Well, the, the problem is, is because the state's asserting a, a parent's patriae theory where... Uh, uh, the but they're theory. also asserting they their own interests the as proprietors of the university and otherwise tax revenues. Uh, yes, but let me finish with the first theory and I'll get to that. Uh, the, the parent's patriae theory assumes you're asserting the rights on behalf of the beneficiary, but... Uh, there's well-established law that in the, in the immigration context, the, the sort of third-party interest, uh, and the case O'Bannon uh, describes this, is not something that can be asserted. Uh, I, I'd also I suggest that Gary the, versus Dead asserts exactly that. I mean, in, in Gary versus Dead, the plaintiff, Dead, was the, was the wife of the person who was excluded. So the person who was excluded may not have had any rights that he could assert directly, but his wife was allowed to. And the state, I mean, the state doesn't have the sort of constitutional rights that the uh, wife in Din had. The, the wife in Din was asserting right? her own. But why isn't the state's right the same as the scholars in Mandel? And Mandel was a foreigner. He might not have had rights, but the court took the case up because the people who argued they wanted to be able to hear him various universities to which you've been invited. Well, University of Washington, Washington State invite people. Why doesn't the state of Washington have the same standing that the scholars did in Mandel? The, uh, again, you have to look at sort of the right of the state. And I, I, I guess I was discussing the right of the state on behalf of the people that it wants to it's bringing suit on behalf of. It's sort of collapsing the inquiry. Uh, uh, I understand you're, you're, you're moving away, or I'm, I'm dragging you away from the parents' patriae theory. Just speaking for myself, I agree with you on that. The state can't do that. But the state is also asserting a proprietary interest, in particular as the owner and operator of the universities. And it seems to me they line up very much as the way the plaintiffs in Mandel did. Well, on that point, our claim is that it doesn't have a judicially cognizable or legally protected interest in third-party immigration benefits. The but that's exactly scheme, the same case that was raised in Kerry versus Dem, and the majority of the court didn't say that. That was an immigration case. Mandel was an immigration case, both involving visa denials. But, and yet and then we have to talk about... Sure. Then we have to talk about what the constitutional interest of the state entity is. And it's well established that there's no due process. Why is it limited to the state entry? I mean, in, in, in Den, she wasn't asserting her own rights. She was asserting her husband's rights. In Mandel, no, she was asserting her... Sorry. Sorry, you are. It was, her, it was her right as the wife, claiming the loss of consortium and so forth. But the visa denial was to her husband. In this case... The state of Washington is claiming that it's going to hurt the university if it's not able to have these people come to the university. That sounds very much like the same kind of right that was asserted in Mandel. Well, hurting the university isn't enough now that we've turned on to the, the actual challenge. The, the, state has to assert, the state has to have a constitutional interest because the, in Din, it was the constitutional interest of the U.S. citizen spouse that the court was looking at. And if so you what get was the constitutional interest in Pierce versus Society of Sisters, where the school was allowed to assert the rights of the students and their families? Uh, that was a case where, uh, if I remember correctly, the the uh, the, the uh, university was acting on behalf of of. Uh, of, of excuse me, challenging a state law where, uh, that affected its students. Uh, there, uh, there you would have constitutional interests for the, uh, the students at the school. Here, uh, aliens would not. Uh, I do want to turn to but a very important Isn't that the merits question? So why can't we reach the merits question? through the third party standing asserted by the universities and the states here, the universities are part of the states. 
the claims of the party. I would not have the, uh, if there's not any of the uh, declarations indicate that the state universities invite foreign scholars to come to the state and presentations, come for a time, go back, uh, and that they want to continue doing that, and which means that probably would be future invitations to scholars who not yet have a connection with this country. I believe there are some declarations along those lines, but I am describing the actual statement of the extent of their suit that they made in the brief to this court. And to the extent that is the relief they seek, uh, this court should immediately stay the relief that extends broader, and that is to people who have never been to the United States. Uh, and Section 5 of the order, which, which is the refugee provision and, and applies to people who haven't been here yet and don't have those relations with the university and don't, and don't quote, involve longtime residents who are here and have constitutional rights. I'm into my rebuttal time, but I would strongly encourage the court, even if it has concerns with the government's position, that it immediately stay the portion of the injunction that applies outside the boundaries of the U.S. Uh, and extends beyond people who have been in, who are in the U.S. or who have been in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Purcell? 